Okay, uh, good afternoon. Um, today I'm joined with uh, Rick Peirce, the Chief Executive of Education, and Professor Spurrier from SA Health. And the purpose of the, uh, the uh, calling you in today is to provide advice regarding uh, a change in directions concerning uh, mandated vaccinations. As of one minute past midnight tomorrow morning, uh, the mandate for education department or education sector and the passenger transport sector will be revoked. These uh, mandates under the direction for the Emergency Management Act will be replaced with management directions put in place by the uh, agency agencies responsible for those particular sectors. Uh, uh, Rick is here to talk about what the future looks like uh, for education moving forward beyond midnight tonight. These changes are coming about as a result of uh, the continual review of the requirement for these directions and it was always the case that uh, these directions put in place for mandates were done so so that we could implement quick and effective change regarding vaccination requirements and it was always intended that they would be replaced where necessary with other measures that were more sustainable and more long term beyond the declaration under the Emergency Management Act. So I'm happy to take any questions on that um, before handing over to Rick. Uh, what other sectors, Commissioner, or is it just these two? So the two that are being uh, revoked at midnight are the education sector and the passenger transport workers sector. Also affected by this are, is the maritime workers uh, who currently have a direction in place that uh, prevents them from getting onto a vessel, an international vessel arriving in South Australian waters unless they're vaccinated. That was actually put in place as a part of our border protection arrangements and is no longer required, so that's also been removed. What's in the catalyst? As I said, um, continual review of the requirement for these mandates under the Emergency Management Act and working with the different sectors to make sure they're positioning themselves to continue to provide a safe environment for workers and patrons of those sectors after the direction uh, is no longer in force. Um, where possible, we're moving as quickly as possible to remove those directions. And I think uh, South Australia Police was a good example of that continuous review and change. At the time of doing the police uh, revocation for vaccination mandates, I was corresponding with sector representatives, uh, requesting them to review the requirement for their directions going forward as well. And the changes today are a consequence of those consultations. It's not because the education sector is at a crisis point and they desperately need more teachers as soon as tomorrow? No, I think when uh, Rick explains what uh, steps he's putting in place as of midnight tonight, uh, once that is explained you'll understand that uh, essentially there's not a lot of change for people, although we are enabling unvaccinated people to come back into the workforce under certain conditions similar to what police have in place. Have the legislation rules changed at all um, any further? I know you changed them last week, but are those in workplaces, they change at all? No, uh, isolation requirements for COVID positive people remain the same, as does quarantine for close contacts. It is a subject of continuous review. Um, SA Health are continuing to do work on that and uh, it's also being looked at from a national perspective, but there are no changes being announced at this time. Commissioner, why, um, why just these two sectors? What's so different from, say, education through to, say, disability care or even aged care? Uh, it's based on the advice that we've received from the agency representatives and obviously Rick is here to talk about education. Professor Spurrier is well positioned to talk about SA Health and their position at this point in time given the, the nature of people who are visiting healthcare uh, establishments is that the mandate is still required. Can you give us a list of all of those people in the passenger transport sector? That's quite a broad... Well it includes, yes yeah, sorry, it includes uh, bus, train, um, uh, tram workers. It also includes uh, uh, ride shares such as Uber and also taxis as well. So workers in those environments will no longer be mandated under the, pol uh, the police direction, but there will be steps put in place to ensure the safety of patrons of those services. Does that include extra rat tests for people who are unvaccinated? I'll let uh, Rick ex explain exactly what steps are being put in place as of midnight. Well, are you concerned about the uh, numbers at the moment, Commissioner, hospitalisations and or cases? Uh, Professor Spurrier is here also to talk about um, the current case numbers, but I, I can say in my conversations with Professor Spurrier, uh, whilst the numbers are high in terms of daily numbers, um, it's not outside of what the predictions were. Uh, we've shared the modelling that shows that we have a clear understanding of where we're heading and what, what we're anticipating in terms of coming down the other side of that peak. And as w I've said uh, several times, and I think Professor Spurrier will support this, uh, the key 
uh, issue for us is hospitalisation rates, and they're within estimates at the moment as well. We saw earlier this week a boost in our campaign to boost the booster rate. So are we vaccinated enough now that we can take these mandates away, or are we still trying to boost that. I'm, I'm confused. It might be better if I let Professor Spuria talk about the vaccination rates and the impact it has on the changes we make. But you why say, now? Uh, because she's here to talk about it. Oh, but, but, but why? Yeah, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, why are we removing the mandates now? Like, what was the check and balance yeah. that so, was as made? So, as I as I said at, at the beginning, uh, the the mandate under the Emergency Management Act was put in place so we could implement quick and effective changes that saw. Uh, staff in critical sectors being vaccinated as quickly as possible and getting those vaccination levels up to a high standard. That has been achieved and the intention was always to replace the mandate under the Emergency Management Act with a more appropriate mechanism to manage the workforces in these particular sectors. That's where we're at. So what do you say to people that have done the right thing, gone and got vaccinated and yet here you are and the three, three of the most powerful people in the state telling the community that actually it's okay to return to schools and other being unvaccinated. What do you say to those people who have actually gone and got the jabs as you've requested? Well, people who are vaccinated and comply with the requirements under a management direction that will replace the emergency management direction will have the advantage of not having to rat test on a daily basis and there will be some concessions in relation to where they are required to wear masks. People who are unvaccinated will have other requirements they have to meet in order to return to the workplace. So there is a distinction there um, and it's still the strong advice uh, that people should be vaccinated and up to date with their vaccinations and that is the position that uh, South Australia Police have taken is the requirement is to be vaccinated. If you are not vaccinated then there are other steps you have to take to ensure that you are not passing on the virus to other people. Does this undermine your message, though? What, do, what no, do you I don't say think, to people that believe it might? I don't think it does. Uh, the strong advice and the consistent ongoing advice is that vaccination is the best way to protect yourself and other people, minimise the risk of spreading the virus, and Professor Spuria can elaborate more on that. We have taken steps to get vaccination rates up as quickly as possible in critical sectors, and it was always the intention that we would transition to more appropriate mechanisms for ongoing management of these requirements. When the declaration under the Emergency Man Management Act ceases, all of these mandates will fall away, but COVID will still be here and there'll be a requirement for us to continue managing our workforces as safely as possible. Do you think that will happen in the next 28 days? Is that when you're expecting that to happen? Uh, look, it's not possible to forecast ex exactly when we think it might expire, but I can say that on requesting a renewal for a further 28 days, I am considering where the opportunities are for us to revoke the declaration either during that 28 day, day period or at the end of it. But there will be considerations regarding the current set of circumstances we're looking at in 28 days time. You say that um, uh, none of the other sectors um, are having their direction revoked at this point in time. Are you reviewing them with the view to revoking them before the declaration ends? We are working with the representatives of those sectors to ensure that they are doing a constant review of the need for the mandate to be in place and the timeframes they require in order to implement an alternative uh, mechanism such as a workforce direction under their authority. So that work is ongoing with the different sectors and that includes SA Health and SA Health are putting steps in place to find an alternative mechanism to go forward. Rick, can I please ask you, um, sure. Do you run the risk of all that all with you know, parents at home thinking, oh, unvaccinated teachers will be back? And, and how will unvaccinated teachers work, I guess, within the school environment? Sure, thank you. Um, look, as the Commissioner said, the direction has served us incredibly well. Just for context, because I think it's important, in government schools and preschools in South Australia, we have about 31,215 staff. About 204 of those 31,200 chose not to be vaccinated and they are on leave. So the vast, overwhelming majority of our staff are vaccinated. We've worked closely with the Commissioner and his team as with Professor Spurrier and SA Health throughout. We are implementing, in, I'm implementing an interim managerial direction as of tomorrow that will maintain uh, the position with respect to the uh, two vaccinations and will require any staff who are unvaccinated coming back to the workforce to wear uh, to wear a mask at all times while indoors and take a daily rapid antigen test. There will also be certain settings within the South Australian schools 
where those people will not be able to work. High risk settings based on the health advice. So uh, our remote Aboriginal schools, uh, our uh, disability units in our special schools across South Australia uh, are in that uh, case. And also for our workers who work really, really closely one on one with a um, child or student who's uh, uh, got underlying health conditions and immunocompromised. Well, this 208 staff make a massive difference welcoming them back when there's so many teachers on leave because of COVID at the moment? Oh, look, we, we're happy to welcome them back, but they will be under those conditions. But as I say, 200 out of 31,000, we're, we're in the margins. So this is not a response to challenges with respect to staffing, but absolutely, we will, work, we will welcome them back um, uh, in conjunction with their leader. Um, as of tomorrow, provided that they're complying with those interim arrangements. Simultaneously, I'm starting a consultation with our staff regarding a new draft vaccination policy for South Australian government schools and preschools. That will be launched today and will be out for one week of consultation. Do you anticipate getting rid of the mandate post this survey? Well, we've never had a mandate for a medical procedure in South Australian education in the past. Um, but I should say we are very, very pro-vaccination amongst our staff and amongst students because it keeps people safe. So we will do everything possible to make sure that vaccination is uh, available, easy to get, um, uh, without, uh, without too much trouble, and we will continue to advocate for it. But we do respect that there is a, a fraction of our community who choose not to, and uh, if they continue in their workplace, there will be conditions put upon them. Um, to uh, make it as safe as possible for our staff and students. Those on vaccinated teachers have to get their rat tests at their own expense. Could you repeat that? Those on vaccinated teachers have to get their rat tests at their own expense. No, no, we'll provide those and masks. Um, difficult to find relief teachers at the moment in schools. Is that sort of a motivating factor? Uh, it's not a motivating factor on this. This is something we've been working with the Commissioner on for four months. Uh, obviously, these directions um, uh, uh, cease to be valid when the emergency management declaration ends at some point in the future. So we wanted to be in front of that. Uh, and we also wanted to do that in consultation with our staff. So so we uh, are well prepared for it. And as I say, putting in place these interim arrangements. So, so, you might just ask that. Those rules have just been in place, will they also go up once the mandates um, end when the emergency management Okay. Look, it really depends on the feedback on the consultation, but I'd imagine that we will continue to be putting in place the best settings and risk management settings for our most vulnerable kids. Yeah. Um, we will always do that with SA Health. So uh, I want to reassure parents that we are continuing to take this very, very seriously, and the most vulnerable um, members of our school communities and preschool communities uh, are a constant um, uh, uh, and urgent uh, priority for us, and we always work with the uh, well, professor on that. Rick, you, um, the, the Premier last week made it abundantly clear he doesn't want to shut schools and, and, and give an extra week of holidays to students, albeit I think most kids would appreciate that. But <laughs> um, have you provided any advice since then that may require a change of opinion with the Premier in terms of you being able to manage teachers and students being off? Uh, no, what uh, I haven't provided any additional advice. Look, it's it's challenging at the moment, but but what uh, my conversation with the premier uh, was uh, very clear. Um, we don't believe that there is a need for a statewide blanket approach to that. What the premier um, uh, said and also understood was that um, uh, there will be specific site-based arrangements, as you're seeing now in the community, where we've got a particular. Um, uh, impact of the virus on staff and or students where we might move to remote learning, um, but we uh, intend to finish the term strong. What is the current state of your temporary relief teacher workforce? Because there's obviously a pool of 4,000 at the start. How much have you ebbed into that? Oh, we've, been, we've been eating into them pretty seriously. Uh, <laughs> uh, look, we're, I mean, teachers, SSOs are members of the community and as cases rise in the community, it no doubt manifests itself in our schools and preschools. Um, I want to thank all of our staff at every level in every school and preschool, childcare, all across South Australia, not just government schools, for for um, how hard and how flexible they're working at the moment, including those TRTs. So we are um, 
we're obviously feeling um, uh, pressure in our specialist teaching areas and the further away from the metropolitan area makes it a little bit more trickier, but we're going okay. Do you think there'll be any negative with having teachers having to wear a face mask when they're teaching? I know there's been some experience, but is that a drawback with this rule? Uh, the, this is the new rule for the unvaccinated. Yeah. Oh, look, I think it, um, it's, it's, it's not ideal for a teaching perspective, but that's part of it. Um, that's, that's a consequence, that's a risk management strategy for choosing to be unvaccinated. So we're putting in those, place with, uh, those arrangements with the best advice from SA Health. How are we going at the moment with um, schools closed, um, teachers off at the moment because of isolation rules? What's, what are we at at the moment? Uh, well, we've got about 16 schools at the moment where we have a class closure, one of those circuit breakers that I've spoken about before. So that's not a whole school. Um, and they're dotted around the metropolitan area and also in a couple of country locations uh, because it is a little bit unpredictable about where um, we'll get transmission. Um, uh, we also have uh, a couple of our large secondary schools on a remote learning program at the moment. It's just temporary arrangements. Um, some are coming back on Friday and another one's coming back on Monday. As I say, and the Premier really understood this, is, is that where we've got a specific requirement in a specific location, he understands that we're going to have to put uh, arrangements in place to make sure that everybody is safe, firstly, but also that we can have a quality learning program going on. And how many, sorry, um, Harvey, how many um, of those major high schools um, are closed, and can you name which ones they are? Uh, at the moment, it's well, it's it's uh, it's uh, clear. Adelaide High is one of them. Wirreanda is another. Um, uh, we had uh, we had a temporary uh, flip to remote learning at Paralawi, but they're back. Um, but also, uh, Roxby Downs is uh, one of those locations where the area school is on remote learning at the moment. I know we're only three days into the school week, but with the change of the close contact rule, have you already seen um, an easing of the impact on staffing levels? Uh, look, at a little bit. Um, I mean, what SA Health always uh, enabled us to do is recognise that for for uh, some teachers and some school staff that they be designated as essential workers and we were able to bring them back with approval provided they were able to isolate at home and were also um, showing no symptoms. And we've had hundreds and hundreds of our staff um, agree to that arrangement and we thank them for it. And just on the isolation, those in isolation, do you have any rough figure of how many teachers are in isolation? Uh, well, it's a combination of those that are ill with COVID and those that are, are, are caring for children uh, or, or, a, or a partner. Uh, I haven't got the data at the moment, but it is um, uh, in the vicinity of uh, about 850, I think. But if I'm wrong, I'll come back and clarify. Um, Rick, uh, what was the health advice to be able to scrap these mandate, uh, the direction to do that? Well, I don't want to put words in the professor's mouth, but obviously what uh, SA Health are always looking at is uh, community vaccination rates, student vaccination rates. Uh, so there's a series, there's always this kind of um, mix of um, inputs that go into that decision making. So what um, Professor Spurrier was very clear with me about is that there are certain cohorts of, of children um, uh, and staff who might have an underlying health condition which make it problematic and that's why we've we've put in these arrangements the uh, the mask wearing and the daily rapid antigen testing but also declared certain of our sites we have schools at the hospital okay we're not going to have unvaccinated teaching staff at the hospital so that's probably the best example i can give i might pass to professor yeah. Spurrier if that's okay thank you. Thank you very much, um, Rick and uh, Commissioner. So I might just start with today's numbers and then I'll have a few words about um, the change in the mandated vaccination as we've discussed at the press conference. So we do have quite a high number of cases today, 5,496 new cases. Now we do break that down into PCR and um, rapid antigen testing. So there were 3,636 with PCR and 1,870 with rapid antigen testing. Uh, so at the moment, um, and this combines both the people that are admitted to hospital 
uh, for COVID specifically, but also incidental COVID. There's 180 cases in hospital, eight in ICU and one person ventilated. And unfortunately, um, I do have to report we've had two deaths today um, uh, associated with COVID and a man in his 70s and a woman in her 80s. And as always, uh, my um, uh, sincere condolences to the families of those people who have lost their lives. Um, so it is a higher number. Um, this it, it does fit with our modelling um, that we showed uh, to the public last week. And it is, as um, the Commissioner said, uh, more about the hospitalisations than the actual case numbers. But there are <clears throat> many people uh, that don't need to go to hospital but are concerned when they get their positive uh, rapid antigen test or their positive PCR. And many people, there's quite a number of um, people that I know who have had COVID recently and they've been really quite sick and have had to spend a number of days in bed. So it is important to just do those basic things. If you um, have got this infection, make sure you're drinking enough and make sure you rest. There's nothing bad about staying in bed. And if your body tells you to, uh, make sure that you do that. Um, we also have updated our website so it's clear what phone numbers you can use to get specific advice. And also um, uh, our Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Dr Emily Kirkpatrick, has also provided some information this week about um, being able to access the oral um, antivirals uh, more easily in our state. Um, so uh, the, the numbers we do expect to continue to rise and we're working very closely um, with, and I'm working very closely with our healthcare system to make sure that we have both in hospital care, but also the out of hospital care for everybody that requires it in our state so that everybody stays safe. Um, now, just a little bit back to the vaccine mandates and really the important thing is um, thinking about the emergency management declaration that has absolutely um, it's been really been fantastic and worked very well in our state over the two years of the pandemic. But going forward, um, we do need to at some point transition away from that as an emergency. And of course, this emergency management declaration is previously been used for bushfires or for recent floods, but never for as long as uh, in this situation with the pandemic. So um, along with all of the other states and the other chief health officers, we've always been aware that we will need to transition any mandated vaccine requirement for COVID into some other sort of um, uh, 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 either a legal instrument or a policy um, that might be put out in terms of an organisation. And we can already see that that's happened in our state. And one of the really pleasing things is that um, other parts of our community, for example, the zoo, the convention centre, um, Flinders University, Coles, uh, have mandated vaccination requirements for their staff. And it hasn't come in under a government direction. It's because those organisations um, consulted with their workers and they understood the, um, the effectiveness of the vaccines and they wanted to protect their staff and also uh, people that they're um, workers might come into contact with. Uh, so we're moving to that phase. And as the commissioner said, um, all of the mandates and the sectors where, who are responsible are looking very closely at those transition arrangements. So from a health perspective, we're doing exactly the same. Um, and also uh, we're taking a lead for aged care and disability and health. And we're looking at um, uh, other uh, types of uh, legal instruments such as the Public Health Act uh, and about whether um, it would be more appropriate to do that or whether it would be more appropriate, uh, appropriate to um, have a uh, policy within a particular department. Um, so this is just part of that transition. It's not to signal at all that um, vaccine is not incredibly important. Um, just in terms of the maritime, I think everyone would understand that was when we had border control arrangements. So that's very clear. We don't need that anymore. Um, the um, education, one of the uh, reasons, um, in initial reasons for, for me was that we couldn't vaccinate children at that time. So it was very important. We had um, teachers vaccinated. But also, as I've explained um, from my perspective, and I think uh, many people would agree, education is a universal right of every child. And so we need to make sure that we maintain uh, staff so that every child has that opportunity to learn. Um, so there's a couple of reasons, uh, very important reasons why. And I'm so pleased that the education department and the CE um, has moved to have a, a policy requirement um, for their staff. In terms of the transport, so if you imagine when we brought this in, um, uh, I was concerned about people who 
didn't have their own um, transport, so were using, needed to use public transport, and that might be because they're older or because they had some uh, disability, um, or indeed it was their choice to use public transport, but some of those people would be at higher risk of having COVID. So that's why uh, we, we um, uh, I recommended um, to have that one in, in for public transport. Now, as things have moved on and we've got higher rates of vaccination in our community, it is timely to um, have a look at that and have a look at other ways that we can uh, have people protected. So bus drivers and uh, train drivers are often quite a way away from passengers in a, in a bus or a train. Uh, and then in terms of the Ubers and taxis, um, uh, from my perspective, I think the most important thing is that a member of the public booking an Uber or a taxi is able to request somebody that is fully vaccinated. So we're just working through um, those uh, issues with the Department of Transport and Infrastructure at the moment. Um, so that's where we've got to. That's the reason is that we are moving to a different space and, and health and aged care and disability will be in the same situation of needing to come up with a, um, a different uh, way of having that requirement but um, everyone I think would appreciate the importance of having um, uh, vaccination for staff working in those particular uh, industries because of the vulnerabilities obviously of people in those settings. I guess the virus has been ripping through schools so is it just for show to have these rules on teachers a little bit who are unvaccinated coming back in the classroom or do you think they're, they're actually needed? Oh no, they're absolutely needed. Um, now one of the, and you, you use the term ripping through schools and, and in fact probably this is a good um, example of why we do have rules around quarantine of close contacts and isolation of cases. People understand that we haven't got those rules in schools and the reason was, was we knew that if we did we'd have to shut down schools and classrooms a lot. So we've been accepting of having more disease um, but it's just a good um, example of it actually being the virus that's the problem infecting people as opposed to the rules that are making people have to stay at home um, so it is something that's going to be uh, you know ongoing and challenging um, particularly I'm looking over to the the winter months and uh, when we're thinking about vaccine mandates particularly uh, thinking about winter here in South Australia and, and such like and you know potentially having flu here as well. Professor um, forgive me if you did allude to this, but did you actually provide advice that paved the way for these mandates to go? Or uh, did no. you, do you support them? No, so perfectly comfortable with the progression um, because I think we've got a very uh, uh, robust mechanism for replacing that mandated vaccination in schools. I've described what we're doing with the patient transport and obviously Maritime we don't need anymore as a state. Um, so um, I certainly provide a written advice at the time when we were bringing the mandates in and then um, I can see to the future we cannot be using an emergency management declaration. We have to be looking at other ways of having these mandates going forward. And therefore, sorry, um, and therefore is it fair to interpret the fact that you don't believe that any form of allowing unvaccinated healthcare workers back to um, back to work is something that you will be advising in the future? Um, well, that's quite a difficult uh, question to, to answer in a, in a very short space of time. But uh, the people who are really vulnerable to this disease are obviously in our healthcare systems. And this is not necessarily just older people, but it includes people with chronic health problems, people with respiratory problems, people with uh, heart conditions. And also there are a range of people who are fully vaccinated, but because their immune system is suppressed, have not been able to mount the same sort of um, immune reaction to the vaccine as other people and cannot protect themselves. And that will be young people who are receiving chemotherapy in our oncology wards, for example. Um, so we need to put in the highest level of protection in our hospitals, but also obviously in our aged care and in disability. So that's number, is that the second highest in a day? Uh, yes, well, I did have a quick look at this, and that's what my media team said when they pulled out the numbers. So I think this is our second highest. Professor, yes. Can I ask you about the hospital system in terms of COVID, the number of COVID patients? Those numbers from our reports that we're hearing from staff are okay, um, but in terms of the staffing, the doctors and nurses, people that are looking after these people, they're really struggling. They're working overtime, they're not having days off, and they're looking at the next couple of weeks thinking, oh my gosh, how are we going to do this? 
What's your thoughts on the coming weeks with this hospital system with so many people out because of isolation? Yeah, so in my job as the Chief Public Health Officer, my job is to keep people out of hospital. Um, so our um, Chief Medical Officer, Mike Kuzak, um, is involved with helping planning those, um, um, you know, the, the uh, the um, medical workforce and of course our CE Dr Chris McGowan is very much involved. However I do get on a meeting every morning uh, with the CEOs and we go through um, what the cases are like, uh, what the movements are in the hospitals and I think one thing in South Australia which stands us in really good stead is it's very closely networked and so um, if one hospital is under a particular pressure there will be a discussion and a movement of people and patients around that system closely working with SAS as well. So. Um, we uh, have our new government coming on board, um, very much uh, enjoying working with Minister Picton um, and the rest of the team. Um, so, as I said, we're closely working uh, with, with, uh, with the hospitals. And I also was very pleased to be able to be part of um, an update with unions yesterday. It's very important to be involving um, those important uh, bodies that represent our uh, healthcare workers and was able to walk through the uh, modelling with them and, and explain it to them. Oh, absolutely. And then up until recently, I was working actually in paediatrics at Flinders, so absolutely can understand that pressure. Mr. Bickton was talking about that search for extra beds. Is there a number you want to deal with the coming search? Um, so, uh, as we've put out the modelling uh, publicly, people know that there's a 200 bed um, uh, and that we're working at that. Uh, and just to say, and this is what I was able to explain to the um, uh, unions yesterday, that the modelling is not static, it's iterative. So we put in our own case numbers and then we recalibrate the model um, and we do that on a regular basis. Um, so, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, and I can't speak for the hospital system. As I said, I'm responsible for keeping people out of hospital, um, but I know that a lot of work is being done. I just maybe if I flip back to trying to keep people out of hospital, um, anybody who has not had their third dose of vaccine, you are also um, important because if you go out and get your third dose of vaccine, uh, you will be helping prevent people getting into our hospital system and that will help take the pressure off. So are you also worried about um, the very low in comparison vaccination rates in children? Yeah, so I would really like to see the vaccination in kids go up. Um, one of the things that we do do when uh, there's been a, over a certain number of um, uh, children in a class, we take that opportunity to send information home to parents to remind them of the importance of vaccination. So I don't know if that will has, has actually shown an, um, an improvement, but again, uh, just urging any parents.